Hello and welcome to CBSNews.com's Hot Sheet Live. I'm Nancy Cordes. Well, the last Republican presidential debate of 2011 is in the books. Last night in Sioux City, Iowa, the remaining seven candidates met for one last time before the Iowa caucuses in early January. Who were the night's winners and losers? And did Mitt Romney miss an opportunity to hammer the new frontrunner, Newt Gingrich? Here to discuss it all, Yahoo News' David Chalian, The National Journal's Reed Wilson, and joining us from The Washington Post, Nia Malika Henderson. Hello to all of you, and happy holidays. Happy holidays. You too. So, uh, David, let's start with you. What did you think of the debate last night? I thought it was in uh, stark contrast to the debate last Saturday night, uh, because Mitt Romney and Newt Gingrich seemed to really pull back from where they were Saturday night, which was really trying to go after each other, and uh, Mitt Romney on the attack to Gingrich. Gingrich uh, very uh, skillfully rebutting those attacks. Mm -hmm. uh, Newt Gingrich's decision to reverse course, double down on his promise for a positive campaign, I think actually helped Mitt Romney last night. Mitt Romney is not comfortable in the attack mode. It does not wear well on him. Mm -hmm. And so he got to revert back to that sort of Mitt Romney we saw throughout the debate season uh, for the last several months, which was that presidential, try to stay above the fray, keep it on President Obama, and that plays well for him. Reed, it seemed like they both realized that locking horns wasn't doing either one of them any favors. Yeah, it doesn't. And look, this is the last time they get a chance to appeal to all these Iowans who are going to show up on January 3rd and caucus for or against them. Uh, it was a largely more positive debate than we've seen. And uh, one of the things that struck me was everybody was taught, clearly told by their advisors, look into the camera. Mm -hmm. uh, they were they were sort of making their closing argument. And you don't want your closing argument to be the other guy's a jerk. You want to mm -hmm. be you want your closing argument to be this is why you should vote for me. I, I think that's why we saw a largely more positive debate, although there were plenty of folks uh, who, who didn't uh, didn't uh, shy away from throwing punches. Uh, Ron Paul and, and uh, Michelle Bachman both got in some, some real good shots last night, uh, primarily against Speaker Gingrich. Right. Nima Malik, I wanted to ask you about that. Why do you think that Michelle Bachman in particular went on the offense like that last night against Newt Gingrich? Yeah, well, at this point, she doesn't have any anything to lose. She's at single digits uh, in Iowa, and I thought she actually had a pretty good performance last night, and she did at the, at the previous debate as well in Iowa, and you could see her really in some ways working or, or doing Mitt Romney's dirty work and going after and going after Newt Gingrich over Fannie and Freddie and going after Ron Paul over his uh, pretty much isolationist, non-interventionist stance in terms of foreign policy. So I think that's going to do Mitt Romney some good if, 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 he, if she can damage those two figures uh, and, and, and depress their, their ratings and then some of that support may go to her. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there, he, there was an interesting exchange that she had with Newt Gingrich where she said, you know what, I am a serious serious candidate. And that's something, obviously, that uh, that whole commander-in-chief test, I think that's something, that a test that she hadn't yet met. And I think, as Reed and, and David said, I think all of them went in last night with this whole idea of we've got to look like the president, we've got to look like a commander-in-chief. And I think all of them uh, were able to do that. And her defense came after Newt Gingrich had said that she didn't have her facts straight. And that's not the first time that he said that about Michelle Bachman. So give us a little uh, reality check here. Uh, has she had her facts straight when she's gone after him on a number of issues? Uh, and was it fair of him to say she doesn't know what she's talking about? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, this morning, uh, politifact.com, uh, the, the sort of arbiter of, of a lot of these things, um, gave her a pants on fire rating when she said that politifact had never uh, said she's got she'd said she'd got anything wrong. So uh, they have they have uh, questioned a lot of her statements uh, in the mm -hmm. past. Uh, some of her uh, statements, specifically on uh, Mitt Romney and and his health care plan in Massachusetts, and now some of the things she said about about Newt Gingrich. So I think throughout this campaign, everybody has had these moments of uh, saying things that aren't exactly true and then being called on it. Mm -hmm. But but her main attack, her first thrust at Newt Gingrich last night, which really did n knock him back on his heels on the on the Freddie Mac stuff mm -hmm. and. The 1.6 million. Her facts there are are pretty much solid. I mean, mm -hmm. she she's not trying to call him a lobbyist when he actually wasn't a registered lobbyist. She is just making the attack that he took money to peddle his influence. There's no doubt that that was the case, and uh, and that is actually what knocked him for furthest back on his heels last night, it seemed right. to me. Nia, I want to ask you about something interesting that Mitt Romney seems to be doing both in in this latest debate and out on the uh, campaign trail, kind of reframing his experience in the private sector and specifically at Bain Capital and trying to uh, rebut this attack that he destroyed jobs and bankrupted companies and that he's, you know, he actually he, uh, he created as many jobs or more uh, and that this is just part of 
capitalism and that it's the president that doesn't understand how this works. Yeah, I mean, he has, I mean, that's in some ways always been his argument, this idea that he has worked in the real economy and he knows how to create jobs. I mean, one of the criticisms that he lobbed at uh, New Gingrich was basically to say, you know, he, he creates theories or he talks about theories and I create jobs. I think this is going to be a little challenging for, challenging for him, this whole idea that Mitt Romney, who I think is worth something like $250 million, uh, knows anything about the real world. I think in some ways people do sort of look at him as a uh, Mr. Rich guy, as, mm. as sort of a patrician uh, figure. But this is part of a debate also that he was having with Newt Gingrich, this whole idea of how Newt Gingrich made his money. Was it mainly through trading his influence or peddling his in influence by serving in government? Or was it like uh, Mitt Romney in the private sector. So these are some of the arguments that are going to that he's obviously going to make and obviously a lob at the president. But again, I think you have people who worked at Bain coming out saying, well, our, our job really wasn't about creating jobs. It was really about creating wealth for our investors. And I think mm. you'll see the Democrats come back and say, well, you created a job. You created lots of jobs, but you also destroyed a lot of jobs as well. And that was mm. one of the things we saw in his races in Massachusetts that people, they cut a lot of ads there with people who were put out of work because of some of the work that uh, Mitt Romney and his partners did. Before we look ahead to Iowa, guys, uh, talk about John Huntsman, Rick Santorum. Did they do anything that changed the game for them in Iowa or anywhere else last I, I, I don't think they did anything at the debate last night. Um, Huntsman, especially on, on China, I, I thought that uh, Huntsman did okay, but not as well as he has done in previous debates. Um, Santorum is always good. Santorum is, is an underrated debater. He's always performed well. It's just that nobody's really looking at him, and nobody right. has throughout this entire process. If, uh, if, if anybody is to outperform their poll numbers in Iowa, I wouldn't be surprised if it is Santorum. Mm -hmm. He spent time in all 99 of Iowa's counties. He's got, he says he's going to have uh, uh, precinct captains in most of the 1,700 uh, different precincts around, uh, around Iowa. So if anybody could outperform, it could be Santorum. But then again, it's not that hard to outperform 2%. Right. I think Ron Paul did himself a little bit of damage last night. He, he's been building uh, a really strong operation in Iowa. We, it's still Probably one of the, the big question marks. It's still one of the big question marks about whether or not that operation can actually deliver caucus goers on the, in the winter night on January 3rd. Right. But, but uh, he, has, he does have some momentum here. Last night he spent an inordinate amount of time on foreign policy, which is where he is at most odds with the Republican electorate. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so where they love his libertarian stuff, um, on um, some uh, economic issues and right. the Fed and what have you, right. uh, that kind of non-interventionist uh, talk that he went and, and talked about quite a bit last night in the debate, I think might uh, some people who would give him a look may have turned away if they are Iowa Republican caucus goers. Right, when you're talking about cutting the military in half and that kind of thing doesn't play well in Iowa. So what do you see going forward? Okay, so now they're, they're, they're unshackled from these debates, finally, <laughs> and they can actually spend the next, next couple of weeks on the campaign trail in Iowa. Iowa, um, what do you see happening? Well, at the moment, uh, I, I think what we see is is a resurgent Mitt Romney and uh, mm. Newt Gingrich's poll numbers have were great for the last couple of weeks, but polls are always sort of a lagging indicator, and they start to, the support has started to erode on the ground. We've started to see that in a couple of uh, robo polls. We've even started to see that in a couple of live call polls uh, that the campaigns are conducting privately. Mm -hmm. uh, they're they're seeing some of that support slip. I think it's very telling that Newt, King, Newt Gingrich is spending today traveling back to Washington D.C. He'll spend tomorrow at a book signing at Mount Vernon, and then at a uh, a concert that his wife Callista is giving, uh, and that. That's all here in D.C. I mean, two weeks to go. This right. is not a time for a break. This is time to get out on the trail and do what Rick Perry is doing with a 40-something uh, stop bus tour, what Michelle Bachman is doing. She'll hit all 99 counties before caucus day, uh, and, and even what Mitt Romney is doing. He's on the trail and all over the place. one of those place. weeks is holiday week. It's yeah. going right. to get very tough to capture voters' yeah. imagination and attention. Well, he may need to mend some fences here in Washington, D.C., Nia. I've been <laughs> shocked this week by just the virulence of the Republican leadership here in Washington, sort of the, uh, the you know, Republican glitterati just, just absolutely slamming him. I mean, they were sounding a note of warning for the first week or two uh, when he started to surge in the polls, but now it's really gotten 
quite nasty. Yeah, and it's obviously uh, not only uh, lawmakers, former lawmakers, but then columnists, George Will, yep. Kathleen Parker, the National Review. Uh, and, and so, yeah, there's a real chorus and a, a real ringing of the alarm, it seems like, among the Republican establishment to say this guy isn't ready uh, to be commander in chief, that he's like a guy uh, who waves around a, a hand, hand grenade and uh, threatens to pull the pin. And, you know, I think at, at some point, Gingrich did have a bit of an opening to say, well, you know what, if the Washington establishment hates me, then maybe I'm doing something right. Mm -hmm. But the problem, I think, for him is that it's it's like a, the floodgates have opened. Everyone is uh, piling on him. And right. at this point, there isn't really a clear sense that he has enough money uh, to go up on the air to rebut some of these charges. You know, he can obviously go on Fox News anytime, anytime he wants, uh, but the sort of concentrated messaging uh, that he needs in on the airways in the form of ads or in form of mailers, uh, I don't think he can afford at this point. So that's a real, mm -hmm. uh, that's going to be a real hurdle for him going forward. Mm -hmm. And oh. he doesn't have precinct captains in many precincts right. in, in Iowa. So I guess he's just yeah. going to be relying on name recognition for the most part. And, and that's what he relied on uh, throughout the lot of his, uh, the early part of his campaign. How funny though that for so long Mitt Romney has, has so desperately wanted to be uh, the candidate of the Republican establishment, has wanted to be accepted <laughs> by all these establishments. And this has finally done and, it for and, him. And the way they do it is when Newt Gingrich <laughs> <laughs> you know, nobody was really worried that Michelle Bachman would be the nominee when she right. surged over the summer. Nobody was really worried that Herman Cain was going to be the nominee because he wasn't putting together that kind of campaign organization. Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, everybody's worried that it might be Gingrich, so they're they're running to Romney. Uh, I, I think I think this only benefits Mitt Romney. He's going to come out of this sort of two weeks of uh, of, of nervousness in in Boston, um, actually being a, a little bit stronger. And if Romney doesn't do that well in Iowa, if he doesn't place first or even second, is that a big blow? For him going into New Hampshire, or does he pretty much have it sewn up there? I mean, I think that the Romney campaign has spent more time setting expectations for Iowa uh, this year than on almost anything else that they've done uh, at their headquarters. Uh, I, I think that. Uh, he certainly doesn't have to win Iowa to continue. Uh, a, a, a Romney win in Iowa does a lot more good than a Romney second or third place showing in Iowa does mm. bad for him mm -hmm. because he has the operation uh, to, to go the distance right. here if he needs to. And no one really expects him to win in Iowa. Okay, so let's do predictions before I let you guys go. Oh, Nia, I will start with you. I know everybody's favorite. Uh, what's your big prediction for Iowa? Wow, this is uh, this is tough. I don't think reporters are supposed to make predictions, but hey, I'll do it anyway. Uh, you know, I think I'm going to go with Romney coming in second, and I'll go with Ron Paul winning uh, winning in Iowa. And if that's the case, I think you know there are all these arguments to be made about Iowa being sort of irrelevant. Mm -hmm. uh, and if he wins, I think that might uh, underscore that argument. Got it. Okay, how about you guys, Reed? That's one of the biggest dangers that that I think Iowa and New Hampshire face right now is the prospect of becoming irrelevant. The Neither of them are holding their first prim the first primary in the nation this year. Mm -hmm. The first primary in the nation was the debate season that we just went through. Uh, and uh, debatable as to who, who won, but I think in Iowa we're going to see a, a, strong show a stronger showing than we think from uh, Mitt Romney, uh, Ron Paul, and from uh, Rick Santorum. But then again, as I say, Santorum's so far behind that even a, a stronger showing than expected isn't going to get him anywhere close to where he needs to be. David? I I uh, am predicting that we are going to see not a great deal of distance between each of the candidates and when the results come in in Iowa. I, and, and with that, if the candidates are pretty closely bunched together, we're going to see many more tickets out of Iowa than maybe we normally do. Anybody willing to put $10,000 on their <laughs> wager, though? <laughs> maybe a steak dinner. I think the uh, statute of limitations on that joke has probably run out. So this is our course. last show of the year, so I'll, I'll make it now. Um, David Chalian, Reed Wilson, Nia Malika Henderson, thank you all so much for being on the show today. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And that's it for Hot Sheet Live today. Join us here every Friday at 1230 p.m. I'm Nancy Cordes. Have a great weekend. See you later.